welcome back. I'm Carrie Wilson, Director of Communications here at Two Cities, joined today with Pastor Kyle and the one, the only, Andre Filardo, our Director of Campus Facilities, Facilities on the Campus. Come on. Um, yep. <laughs> and the honorary title holder of the Bro Professional Award. Andre, any words? Uh, it's immense uh, privilege to be <laughs> dubbed that. And uh, hopefully, who I dubbed up you to that? It. Stephen Lawrence. Okay. Of all people. There we go. Now, what do you do as our director of uh, facilities? Oh, man. It varies from day to day. It could be anything from taking care of the kids' wing, painting, drywall, um, outside spraying weeds, watering our beautiful sod that Come we on. have. Um, it just varies every single day, and uh, I love it. So here yeah. we are. Well, well dude, grateful. I mean, Andre, if it's broken, you can fix it or you know who can fix it. Exactly. And then really, you do so much behind the scenes to make sure our campus is safe and clean and ready for people to really hear and respond to the gospel yeah. on the weekends. We talk a lot about trellis and vine ministry, mm -hmm. and you are doing some of that trellis ministry here in our church. It's often unseen. And so hopefully a couple people the next couple weekends come up and thank you for your work, because I know we're grateful yeah, for yeah. all that you do. And for me, that. I mean, we always say that we want to hire as, when we can internally. And so I love that, again, you were, we'll get into this thing today, but you were in our church, loved our church, were a part of our church yep. before we ever even considered are you coming on staff? So that, that's it's been it's been a great and excuse me and it's been a great fit. So yeah. thank you. That's great. Well, as we get started here today, we're launching into our Jonah series. Um, we're going to be in Jonah for four four yep, weeks, four right, weeks, Kyle? Yep. What are you hoping that our church experiences throughout the series? Well, I, I think uh, basically to realize, if, if I could say one thing, it would probably be to say that uh, to realize that we are Jonah. I mean, that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest themes, you know, in the book is that the book is a. I say this in the first sermon, but it's a critique on the religious spirit. It's it's such an interesting story because it's about a prophet who is the worst person in the story and doing the exact opposite of what he should be, and the only person not listening to God. And so, I think it's a great critique on what Christians and churches can become. And I think mm. he's also a model of restoration, redemption, That's second good. chances. So I'm looking forward to, to covering all of that hopefully in the next four weeks. Well, and we're going to talk about a lot of that today. We talk about restoration and second chances. I can't think of any better picture of that than the story of the prodigal son. Yes. Um, and in a lot of ways, we see that prodigal played out in Jonah. What What are some of the ways here in chapter one that we're seeing Jonah as a prodigal? Well, I'll tell you what's interesting as you ask that question is actually you see in the story of Jonah, both the older brother and the younger brother. If you remember when I preached on it, we talked about the, the, the younger brother is the prodigal who runs away and is, the word prodigal means reckless or wasteful. Mm -hmm. And I, I think in chapters one and two, he is the younger son. He is the yeah. prodigal. But if you get to chapter four, he's actually the older brother. Yep. Hmm. And we'll get there in several weeks, but he's the older brother who is angry mm -hmm. that God would be gracious on such a people as the Ninevites. So I didn't even I think, make that yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we actually see both people from Jesus' arguably most famous, impactful parable. So how is he a prodigal in the first one? I mean, I think at the, at the heart of it, he's reckless and wasteful. God has given him so much, the title of an office of prophet, the mm. word of God, a clear opportunity for purpose and meaning That's in his good. life, um, and uh, d clear direction. Uh, and he wastes all of it by, I talked about this, but by going down and by running away from God. Yeah, no, I, I can't think of a better picture of that of that story. Um, as we start to think about this, I wonder if you could just define that a little more for us. In yeah. our current cultural climate, when you think of the word prodigal, who are you picturing? What are some characteristics of their life? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know all that we'll talk about today, but, you know, there's classic. So I did 10, uh, 10 years of college ministry. And so when you're doing college ministry, you're focusing on a, I met a lot of prodigals, but I'm, I'm, I'm I'm focusing a lot on 18 to 22 year olds. And now that I'm a pastor of a church that's multi-generational, I'm dealing with a lot of people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and it's those people, and some people in their 40s, that feel like, man, when I talk about prodigals, I'm talking about their son, their daughter. I think yeah. a prodigal is anybody who, I would define them as anybody who had access to the gospel in the home usually. Um, and they they had a season, you know, a lot like the every, almost every eight, 10, 12 year old in the house is gonna say, mm -hmm. I love the Lord. I love the church. Uh, I'm a Christian. My parents are Christians. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's a lot of times I think prodigals hit parents where it's like, I raised my son or daughter in the faith. And now we hope it's just a season, but they're having a, what appears to be a season of being reckless, yeah. wandering, uh, being wasteful, running away. And honestly, we maybe we'll get into this. This fits under the larger category. If we're, if we're looking in scripture, mm -hmm. what's the bigger category? Apostasy. Hmm. So, wow. just interesting. So, if you so think about it, there. I mean, yeah. So, the church has been dealing with apostasy since the New Testament was written. Yeah. Uh, I mean, First John chapter two talks about those who went out from us were never of us. And so, John's trying to answer the question to the early church: 
What about these people who said they follow Jesus? I mean, Paul talks about Demas. Demas was with me, but then Demas fell in love with this present world. So the the larger category is we always struggle with people. We all know them. Mm-hmm. People who, they were in my youth group. They were in my mm-hmm. college ministry. Yeah. They were in our church. I can think of several people who were not on our launch team, but they were in the early days. They were a vital and vibrant part of our church yeah. who are not walking with the Lord right now. And it's, you know, you and I know some of them. Yeah. And so I think the larger category is apostasy. I think when most people think of prodigals, they're thinking of someone who grew up in the church, is connected to a family that cares for them, and uh, and is in a season of open, obvious, outward rebellion. Mm. And could be on the way to apostasy. Uh, they're not yes. there yet, but yes. that's where it's leading. Yes. Yeah. No, that's yeah. good. I think one thing that we want to keep in mind as we talk about this today is like, to some extent, we are all the prodigal. Yes. So as we're sharing the stories, even as you're sharing your story, Andre, today, and we're excited to hop into that and just see all the Lord has done, mm-hmm. it's like everyone listening to this podcast needs to see themselves in the place of the prodigal. Yep. Yeah, and I'll tell you an interesting, I was just listening to it in preparation for this uh, podcast. There's a guy named Derek Webb who yes. actually has deconstructed his faith, and he's... Mm-hmm. Be- Mars Hill, uh, right? Not Mars Hill. He, he wasn't uh, at Mars He was not. No, it, Derek Webb was a singer, songwriter. Oh, he was part okay. of Cademan's Call. But if, if our listeners are listening, uh, and hopefully they are listening, I'm if, if, if that's not I'm going to say. If, if our listeners are interested in this, uh, and if you guys are interested, there's a song that he wrote before he left the faith called Eye of the Hurricane. And if you Google that song, he sings what it's like to be a prodigal. Mm. And it is so interesting. It's like an internal psychological... I almost printed the lyrics and brought them here, but but it, I, I wouldn't do it justice. Anyway, so yes, this is a wow. big deal. This is a common common theme, and this is something that I think every Christian can relate to. Because every yeah. time we we decide to step in to wander into sin, start to have a pattern of sin, you know, I, I was always told you're two or three decisions away from ruining your life. You know, it's like, and, and there's some there's some genuine fear of the Lord that that should put in us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really great. Well, Andre, thanks for coming today, and thanks for sharing your story with us. One of the things that I really appreciate is that so often you've been ready and willing to just share your story so that it can positively impact others and glorify the Lord. Absolutely. that's what you're doing here today. So you've told us that at one point you would have considered yourself to be a prodigal. Can you just share a little background on your story and the things that might have led you there? Yeah. um, Well, I was adopted at four and a half from Romania. Um, Came over, and from the moment I came over to America, I was immersed in Christian culture. My parents and I uh, grew up attending Calvary uh, Baptist over on Country Club. And so I was the kid who knew John 3.16, the Ten Commandments. I mean, mm-hmm. you you name it. I knew the Bible fr- uh, front to back. And so um, I definitely knew the right things to do. Um, I grew up very sheltered, which was in its own way very nice. And... Um, but I think at times it may have led me to becoming a prodigal because I may have been too sheltered. Hmm. Um, when I went to college, I threw everything my parents told me out of the way. I think one thing that you hit on, Kyle, about being a prodigal is there there's that willful choice to walk away. Hmm. I don't think you just wake up one morning and you're like, oh, I'm going to be a prodigal. It's like it's willful over time. Hmm. And so... Um, you know, I started attending a small private Christian college. Truth be told, I didn't like it. I thought it was too constrictive and just uh, not what I thought Christianity should be. There were very good tenets of it. I definitely agree with that. And then my junior year, I transferred over to Furman University. Go Dins. Um, <laughs> but anyways, at Furman, it was very worldly. You could do whatever you wanted to do. And I fell into that culture. I mean, you you name it. I lived the sinful lifestyle in college, partying, whatever it be. And um, that that way of life continued for about six years. So I was prodigal for about six years. Mm. Wow. And I can only imagine what it did to my parents just seeing me grow up in the church. I went on mission trips, part of the youth group, choir, you name it. You know, like on the outside, I was a Christian. And uh, internally, I was not. And so anyways... Um, so, Stepped away from the faith, just very hedonistic, did whatever I wanted to do. And um, it all came, it all climaxed in January of 2021 when I met with my friend JT Grimes. And um, who's a member of our church, but you knew, you knew him before that. Yes, I did. Um, they homeschooled, so we were in constant contact with each other. And so I didn't know JT like I knew him three years ago because he's really become a mentor to me. Hmm. But still, um, one question that changed my life, and by the grace of God, 
Hallelujah. Um, he asked me point blank, what is the gospel? And um, here I was a professing Christian. Even my prodigal uh, era of my life, I would consider myself a Christian. Um, he asked me, what is the gospel? And I couldn't tell him. And I was like, mm. this is the main tenet of my faith. I can't even mm. explain it. And I was very honest with him. I was like, I know it's got to do with Jesus and sin, which is a thir- two-thirds right. of yeah. it. But, you know, I, I couldn't articulate and I didn't, my eyes weren't open to grace and mercy and salvation and substitutionary atonement of Christ in my life. Hmm. Hmm. Well, thanks for sharing that, Andre. Um, as you were talking about that, there was just some things that stuck out to me. You know, you talked about like getting seeing a picture of Christianity in the university you were attending that just didn't sit right with you. And I think a lot mm-hmm. of times that's where this can start for some people. Mm-hmm. Um, you you have this vision of who Christ is and what the church should be, yeah. and sometimes that doesn't match. It doesn't match up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I've said before in my preaching when talking to people, I've said, you know, I want you if you're going to. I don't want anyone to reject Christianity, but I yeah. often say, hey, if you're going to reject Christianity, I want you to reject the right thing. Mm-hmm. I want you to yeah. know this is what you're. You, I don't. If you're rejecting religion, we reject it as well. But yeah. in the wooden sense of, I do things for God, and He loves me because I do things for God. And, yeah. I, and I do see, and I don't. This is not a critique on your family because I think you've got a great family mm-hmm. that you grew up in. Yeah. Um, but let's whether because you have you have the church. You know, I'm thinking of your Christian influences. You have your church. You have your family. You have your school. Yeah. Right? You were. Did you ever go to Calvary Day School? I did not. I was homeschooled. Okay, you're homeschooled. But school. so, that, but even in your school, so in three different environments, they were explicitly Christian. Yes. And sometimes people get inoculated mm-hmm. with just if I can use that mm-hmm. illustration yeah. with just yeah. enough Christianity. Yeah. To you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, on the at Christian schools, I'm not thinking of anyone's Christian school. There's a lot. Of, I love Christian schools. Yeah. But Christian middle schools, high schools, elementary schools, usually you have a lot. I'm stereotyping, but you normally have a lot of the teachers, the administrative people. They they love the Lord. They're yeah. like vibrant, mm-hmm. Jesus loving, Bible believing Christians who decide to actually work in those schools mm-hmm. because they want to be explicit Christian. But a lot of times the kids have had so much Christianity is so normalized to mm. them that they miss some of what you're talking about. They miss yeah. the heart of the gospel. Yeah. Or in some situations like you mentioned and then I'll be done is they get a religious experience like you mentioned at that college. Yeah. And it's 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 lots of Rules. Mm-hmm. I, I describe it as lots of rules, not lots of relationship, lots of law, mm-hmm. not lots of love. Yes. Yeah. And you get kind of a certain form of Christianity, and you're like, if that's what Christianity is, I don't think uh, I don't want any mm-hmm. part of it. And a lot of times, what happens is people are brought back either through a real understanding of the Bible teaches, and or a real understanding of Christian community. Yeah. And that's those good. two things God uses, I've seen, to bring people back. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really good. I wonder, Kyle, what are some maybe even specific societal or cultural factors that, that are at play that would lead someone to, to choose to lead, yeah, live well, the life of a prodigal. I mean, obviously we have so much access to people critiquing Christianity. Mm-hmm. Um, it was interesting. I was just talking to one of my friends who's a, a former Mormon. She's a believer. She's in our church. Great young Christian lady. And she, and she was telling me about how many Mormons are deconstructing their faith. Mm-hmm. And I said, why is that? And they said, well, the, for a long time, all the things about Mormonism were hidden. Mm. And you had to go somewhere, and you had to get access to a library, and you had to talk to a, I don't know, a priest or whatever they mm. were there. And um, and she said, but now all of the history of Brigham Young and Joseph Smith, and I'm not, this is not, I'm not here to beat up on Mormonism, but I'm trying mm-hmm. to say there's all this access to the critical voices against religion in general. Yeah. This yeah. could be against... Um, this could be the new atheism or whatever. So I think I think that that's part of it. I think, uh, there, so deconstructing your faith, taking it apart, is becoming more and more popular. And I, I, Matt Chandler, who many of us will know, he's a famous pastor in Dallas. I, I don't know if I'm quoting him perfectly, but he said something I thought was very insightful about deconstructing. He said, "It's anybody can deconstruct a belief system. Mm-hmm. Mm. If at the end of the day, what, what you're deconstructing is a belief system. Okay, I don't know if I believe in creation, whatever it is. Yeah. I don't know that I believe someone could, you know, whatever. Um, I don't know if I believe in the miracles, but he said if it, that's easy to deconstruct, and anyone can do that for anything. Yeah, he yeah. said. But if you have an experience with the grace of God, like mm-hmm. you're talking about, yeah, you can't deconstruct that. Truly, <laughs> yeah. cha- you know, like I, I, I got an experience where I experienced the love of God, as it's been said, in the soul of man. Mm. That is something that you you just don't deconstruct. That's interesting, Andre. You know, you grew up within that environment in, in a gospel speaking family in a gospel preaching church. We have a lot of respect for, oh, yeah. for Calvary. Yeah. Um, you, you know these truths that he's talking mm-hmm. about. Um, 
during this time that that you were kind of following the ways of the world, as you would say, yes, was there this internal struggle within you? Any part of you that like felt felt like, okay, maybe I need to to change mm. this, or like, what was that like? This is a good question. Um, I would definitely say because I grew up um, knowing, you know what Christianity was. Again, I saw it as a bunch of do's and don'ts. Yeah. And so I like what you said, Kyle, like the university I went to before Furman was definitely religious mindset. I don't think they meant that, but that's the way it came across. And then at Furman, it was just deconstruct your faith, do whatever you want. Um, and so um, I definitely felt that internal anguish, I would say, because yeah. I knew, I don't know, I didn't really see it as I was sinning against God. I saw it more as sinning against my parents. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to do that. But at the same time, I was like, well, they didn't really, I wasn't really given a good alternative, or at least at the time, Christianity didn't seem like a good mm-hmm. alternative because, mm-hmm. again, I just saw it through the lens of religion. So I was mm-hmm. like, well, do I really want to, you know, be part of a religion that is like, don't drink, don't cuss, don't smoke, don't do all these mm-hmm. rules and do this. And none of it is attainable without the grace of God in order to be obedient to him. And so um, I definitely did feel that internal struggle because I mm-hmm. knew mm-hmm. what I was doing was wrong. Again, as I said, it, w- it was willful. It wasn't mm-hmm. just like I woke up one morning, I was like, oh, well, I'm going to do everything my parents told me not to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was slowly falling into it. Yeah. How well, did that – go ahead. I was going to say, you know, it reminds me, it's really funny, but I, this this week I saw this – this thing that went, I don't know if you guys saw this, 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 uh, you know, different things go viral on social media. Mm-hmm. And there was some, I, I think he's like a teenager. He, he was wearing a, a shirt at a baseball game and, and it went viral. And the shirt said, I can't, I'm Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was really, and they were laughing. The, the, the sports commentators were talking about it. And, and it was so funny because I think he's making fun of himself and he may not be more, maybe he's making fun of Mormons. But I think we can't have that mentality. Mm. That mentality, I can't, I'm Christian. Yeah. Um, which, again, there's a lot of things. I, so I, I, I've taught this before, that the the, the uh, Ten Commandments, except for the, I think it's right, except for um, the Fourth Commandment, the Sabbath, are all negative. Mm. Yeah. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And, and scholars say one of the reasons is because you have to first be told what not to do before mm. you can be told what to do. Yeah. You need to be told, don't touch the yeah. outlet before you can be told... Well, it's actually used to charge things, and here's how you use it. It's like, just for now, you're two, don't touch it. Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. but if we don't ever move beyond a Christianity that mm-hmm. says, I can't, I'm Christian, mm. it, it needs to say something like, you know, and this is why I've talked a lot about um, mission, yeah. adventure, yeah. L- responsibility, mm-hmm. uh, influence, meaning. I mean, all these other th- walking with God, deep so friendships good. and community. And, and to say, yes, there are some things that we got to say as Christians. I can't, I'm Christian. True. But hopefully we can say more like, but but I'm actually experiencing a life. I'm experiencing what Jesus calls the abundant life. I get to do this. I get it's to. not exactly. I have to do yes. this. That's yep. so good. Yep. Andre, I, I'm curious, like, you know, you talk about like, it felt at the time like rebelling a little bit against like what your parents wanted for your life as well. Mm-hmm. They're witnessing you kind of walk down this path, how aware were they of what was going on in your life and what effect did you see it having on them? Um, well, <clears throat> again, I was in college, so I wasn't with them 24 seven. So again, I don't really know cause the effect that it was having on them, I knew that they were heartbroken. I mean, when your son or daughter walks away from the faith, I mean, as a Bible believing parent, as a, you know, Christian, you can't be okay with that. And whether mm-hmm. it's with a, mm-hmm. uh, a child, a sibling, friend, it breaks your heart. And so um, I could see it in their eyes when I'd come home from college. You know, I'd only talk about all the parties I went to and just everything that they didn't stand for. I knew that it was hurting them. So I could definitely see it. But again, even though I willfully was doing this, they still loved me. I think that's what Jesus does for us. He doesn't allow us to stay in our sin, but he loves us through our sin. Mm. And that's what my parents did. And I don't know if this is too far forward. Um, go go where it goes. But I remember um, a real life prodigal moment. And so I got actually kicked out of college, flunked out, just, I mean, really just hit, you know, like the prodigal son with the pigs. That was where I was at. And so... Anyways, I got a call from my mom. She was like, hey, we know you got kicked out of college. And it was then I was like, okay, well, there's no more hiding it. I, you know, I mm-hmm. wish I had been able to tell them that. But again, I was just so embarrassed at the time. 
So I remember my mom called me. She was like, hey, we know. Come home. And it took a amount of faith to come home because I was like, man, they're going to be so angry at me. You know, they're going to kick me out of the house, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I remember I drove into the, or I got to the house and my mom came and she hugged me and she told me she loved me. And that was one of the most powerful um, betrayals of the gospel and especially of the prodigal son. It wasn't met with, how dare you? Mm -hmm. It was just like, hey, we're going to work through this. But I remember to this day, just her wrapping her arms around me, telling me that she loved me. And I will, I will never forget that. Mm. And so I think even though that wasn't like the turning point, that was definitely like a staple. It's like, okay, mm. this is what Jesus can offer. I still hadn't come full circle, but I, I remember that every single day. Mm. You know, when it comes to parents, what I've seen is a lot of times it takes a while for, I don't say this with your parents, but yeah. it takes a while for parents to even admit to themselves that their child is a prodigal. Mm, you know, it's like they're, they'll, they'll sit there and they'll say, because I've had conversations with parents, well, how's little Johnny doing? Is uh, John, how's, how's Johnny's first year of school? Uh, it, I think he's doing well. Oh, really? Did, did he ever get involved in a church? You don't, he, no, he never, we taught, he never was, well, did he ever get into college ministry? Well, no, he's very busy with, you know, academics mm-hmm. and he's, he wants to do accounting. It's like, you know, I'm not picking on parents and so yeah. it takes a while for the parent to go, he's not prioritizing his faith, yeah. at, le- at the very least. Yeah, and and you know we we versus what parents normally want to do as well. He, there's this cute girl that he's spending time with, and he sure got these five great friends. They're going on spring break together. It's like, okay, great, we're excited about all that. Mm-hmm. How's he doing, or how's she doing spiritually? And sometimes, it, so I got to give it to your parents. Yeah. It, it, it it's hard to feel that like, man, maybe my daughter is not where I thought she was spiritually. And, yeah. you know, th- therefore, how do I pray? How do I respond? Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. Um, we are honoring Mama Florida. Oh, yes. yeah. Come on. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, Andre, as you, as you share that, I, you know, I think one of the things that, that I'm hearing is that it's not always this, like, arc, story arc that we see in, like, The Prodigal Son. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, we hit the pit, and then... We see Christ, we repent, we turn around, and we move in the right direction. Yeah. It really it it can be an up and down journey in the life of many believers who mm-hmm. have like fallen away from the faith. Uh, what did that look like for you to be received with such uh, grace and love, and then still be wrestling with with your your own faith and trying to find your own answers? Um, I definitely say, as I said, with my mom, you know, just telling you that she loved me. That definitely definitely. I think at the time opened my eyes like, okay, the Christianity is a relationship. Yes. It's more than don't do this or do this. And mm-hmm. so that was definitely, as I said, a pivotal moment. Um, but ask the question one more time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like after that, like what happened from there, from what you said, okay. it's like not like yeah. you just like yeah. turned around and walked back towards Jesus and that was the end of the story. I think um, with my story as a prodigal, um, I just constantly saw the Lord pursuing me. Yeah. And so like with my mom, her pursuing me, not giving up on me, even mm-hmm. though her heart was broken. She saw the choices that I had made. She didn't hold them against me. She was very real. Like, hey, you dug, you know, you dug this pit. You got to deal with the consequences. But it wasn't a beating me over the head. And so um, I think it was, as I said, it's just like the little uh, glimmers of hope of the gospel throughout my story Mm -hmm. that brought me back to the Lord. Um, So that was probably 2017, Mm -hmm. 2018 maybe. Um, And then three for another like three years, I just did what I wanted to. Um, I did start coming to two cities at that time. Um, I would say in a way like the wool was still over my eyes. I still wasn't really receiving the gospel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't really comprehend it just because in a way, um, all those years of disobedience, I mean, they do they do have their consequences. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. not saying that God can't work through your disobedience. Of course, he always does. Um, but the real big pivotal moment was when I was confronted with Christ. It's kind of like um, Saul on the road to Damascus. You know, it's like, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I think for a prodigal to come full circle, the Lord comes to them. It's like, hey, he meets them where they're at and he calls them by name. And that's mm-hmm. what the Lord did to me. Mm-hmm. That's like awesome. through JT asking me, what is the gospel? Like I never had that. And so it's to no fault of anyone else, but I was really faced with the decision like, okay, what is the gospel? Am I going to submit? Am I going to surrender? Am I going to repent? Mm-hmm. And again, 
we can't do it in a, in and of ourselves. Yeah. When I went to meet with JT that morning, I had no idea that my life would be forever changed. No idea. Mm -hmm. Cause I was still living in sin, but it was at that moment I was just like confronted with crisis. Like, Holy smokes. Yes. It's not a religion. It's a man. Mm -hmm. When I was That's confronted good. with the man, Jesus forever changed my life. Wow. Wow. I think there's people listening to this right now, and maybe that's going to change their life. So thanks for hopefully by the grace of God sharing that, Andre. As I think about this, is like, man, I'm just curious, um, Kyle, as you're talking with parents and those who are mm -hmm. in the lives of prodigals, not just parents. There's people like JT. JT was a big influence in your life. Like, what are some of the things they're saying to you? Their fears. Yeah, like, yeah. How, how are you encouraging them? Yeah, it's hard because uh, I'll give you a couple without n naming names. I mean, what happens is, um, and I mentioned this in my sermon, there's different mm -hmm. ships that prodigals run away on. Yeah. Um, and, and I think what th they struggle with, they, they struggle with a couple things. They struggle with, you know, what could we have done differently? Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. And it, it is, it, it could be everything from we shouldn't have sent him to that religious college because it gave him a wrong view to, to, you know, why did we send our kids to that high school that was mm. actually a, a public school that yeah. was actually a horrible influence? And that's where they got, you know, their terrible, you know, friends that, that gave them the whatever. And so, so what I'm trying to say is they'll, they'll the one place they tend, depends how sensitive your conscience is, they'll go back and scour their conscience and go, what are all the things we did to contribute to this? And that's when you got to go, all right, you can't change the past. Yeah. Um, let's trust God. Let's God's sovereign. God can use it all. The second thing that they wonder a lot of times is how do I now relate to my prodigal? Mm. Mm -hmm. And that depends, that question. depends on the type of sin they're in. <laughs> True. So what happens is there are nice prodigals. You know, they're, they're like the classic like, liberal today. It's like, oh, you know, coexist bumper sticker, mom and dad, I'm really glad that works for you. It doesn't work for me, but let's have yeah. dinner. Let's have lunch. And that's a different type of prodigal mm -hmm. than, um, you know, there was one family in our church, and and their daughter was uh, a prodigal and was living a lesbian lifestyle. I mean, this is like it sounds intense, but it is intense. Mm -hmm. And then, but they also had a granddaughter because she was married to a guy. But then, anyway, now she's a lesbian, but she has this. They have a grandson, and so I'm just trying to get real here. So basically, they're like, we don't, we completely don't approve of our mm -hmm. daughter's lifestyle. But, but if we are come on too hard. We may lose our relationship with our yeah. grandkid. That's so hard. Mm. And so that's real, guys. There's a couple people in our church that, because because what happens is when you run away, I think I've talked about this before, but if you're running away on the sh on the ship of sexuality, mm -hmm. usually it's such a lifestyle decision mm. that then you're like, well, they're you know my daughter's cohabitating with you know her boyfriend and they want to come on our family trip. Do we bring them? We don't approve of this. Do we make them live in separate rooms? You know, whatever. Yeah. I'm just there's a complexity. So I think complexity on how do we relate to them. Uh, there's a complexity of uh, what was the first one I said. I thought about just um, uh, oh what did we do? Yeah. And then I think um, we, we, kind of connected and then I'll be done is is. How tough and how tender yeah. are we? Which is kind of in all of that. Like how much, because yeah. what you'll feel like if you had, because I've had some prodigals in my life, what you'll feel like with a lot of prodigals is I see them a couple times a year because that's the nature of life. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm ready to have the exact same conversation that I had last time with them. Because that's what you'll it's feel exhausting. like. You'll feel like, yeah. it's like, are we going to talk about his abusing alcohol again? Like, okay, how do I go out at this time? How do we talk about, do I ask questions? You know, and it's funny, I'll tell you a story to end this, is a buddy of mine was having a hard conversation with his brother about a couple things. And I said, how'd it go? And he said, B minus. And I was like, that's every conversation I've ever had to have with a prodigal. Yeah. Just, just to put it in perspective, I feel like every conversation with a prodigal is going to feel like a C plus or a B minus. Because hmm. you're going to have these dreams and these visions and you're going to ask a question and he or she's going to respond. And, and then you realize... You're way ready. You're way more ready to have this conversation than they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're way more like it's way more important to you than it is. And so a lot of times, I just want to encourage people as they mm -hmm. go after their prodigals and they have these conversations, they're probably going to walk away going C plus B minus. But yeah. God uses it. Yeah. When I love it in the picture of like how your mom and and JT and other people in your family pursued you, we see this image of the way that we need to pursue the prodigal is as Christ or the Lord would pursue the prodigal with grace, mm -hmm. with patience with truth yep. and just this continual pursuit. And I, I feel like we see that mirrored in in your story. Um, 
when when it came to that point of like sitting down with JT and him confronting you with this question, um, you say that it changed your life. But what did that look like after after that day? Um, well, I would say <clears throat> it finally was a relationship. It wasn't religion. Um, again, any Christian at some point in their relationship has been confronted with the man Christ because you can tell a person all about the Bible, but unless they know the man Jesus, it, they'll never be changed. Yep. And so, I mean, just just the disciplines, you know, reading the Bible, prayer, fasting, like this is stuff that was only brought upon by the Holy Spirit because, I mean, even when I grew up in church, I had no desire to try to fast. You know, I'd say my nightly prayers, God, forgive me for this and help me to be a better son, whatever, you know. But again, knowing now that it's a relationship, it's not I have to, it's I get to, as you said, Gary. And so um, just the different things like getting plugged into community, how important that is. Because um, one thing with being a prodigal is you're all alone. You really are. And so you... You're all alone with a bunch of people who are all alone in their sin. That's good. And so that never leads to anything good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that was just like the things that, you know, we preach at this church and any Bible-believing church will preach, you know, community, confession, repentance, worship, reading the Word, like that became natural. And it's only brought on by the Holy Spirit. You can't just suddenly wake up one day, you're like, I'm going to do all this. Yes. The Holy Spirit in the hand of your community. Amen. Um, and you were baptized here at I was. Cities, right? Tell us about that. Um, so I actually had been baptized. So I professed Christ when I was eight or nine at Calvary. Um, got baptized there. You know, I thought I was a Christian. And, um, and so anyways, um, I kind of was wrestling. It's like, okay, I've already been baptized once. Should I do it again? Um, and I would say to anyone listening who is contemplating, like, is it okay for me to get baptized twice? I'm a, pro I'm a product of it. I did it, so I'm all for it. Um, but again, I knew after I had that conversation with JT and had an encounter with Jesus that I wanted my faith to be public. Mm -hmm. And so I prayed about it for maybe a day, and I just the Lord was just weighing on my conscience, like, yes, you need to get baptized again. And so... It wasn't because I wanted people to think I was a really great person or because I had to do it. You know, it's because I wanted to. It's like, hey, I want my church body. I want my friends, my family, whoever else it be, to know that I'm publicly identifying with Christ. And so it wasn't even a – it was a question for maybe a day. And so I got – I had an encounter with the Lord on January 21st, and then I think on – February 24th, less than a month or a month later, I was baptized over at uh, Northwest. Amen. And it was my, I remember my dad talking about it when he, uh, cause he has a picture of me coming up out of the water. He's like, you look like a changed man. Mm, and so good. it was really cool. Praise the Lord. What Again. was that like for your family to be there with you on that day? Like how, how is like, they saw these change, not even that day before that. And then after that, seeing these changes in you, like seeing the Lord literally transform you. How did they receive you? How did they support you in that? Um, I mean, they, again, just like the prodigal, uh, prodigal's dad with open arms. Um, I think also the story of the prodigal shows the power of prayer. Because even though it doesn't mention that the father was praying for the son, but I knew my parents were praying for me every single day. My mom still does to this day. She prays for all of us kids every single day. And so I think it just shows the power of prayer. And I think also just the perseverance and the faithfulness of prayer because prayers aren't always answered in a day. And so it took me six, seven years. And so you think about how many prayers that is. That's a lot oh, of prayers. Yeah. Yeah. But yet yeah, just not giving up. And so... Um, again, they met me with open arms, rejoiced with me. And That's so awesome. That's hmm. great. Kyle, any advice for parents and families and how they can welcome the prodigal back into their home after they have turned back toward Christ? Oh, man. Uh, Even for community groups. Yeah, man. Well, you know, I mean, you look at the example of the father and, and he doesn't, we don't, we don't get to see the extended version. You know, yeah. there, there, there may be a time later to have some of the long conversations and yeah. some, let's, let's, let's explain it. Let's talk about, but yeah. I think, I think the initial has to be the open arms mm -hmm. welcome. I, I think one of the things, this is kind of connected to what you asked is I think that a lot of times 
uh, parents who have prodigals need to find some other parents who have prodigals. Mm. That's Just a good word. Whether, whether that's a prodigal that's come home, and, and then that can be an encouraging story, mm-hmm. and or it's just we're grieving together. We, you yeah. know, we're like I've talked about. We're we're suffering and ministering to to each other together because we both know what this feels like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I just I just think you look for look for opportunities. I think it, the, one of the principles is you try to keep the relationship open as much as you can. And like I yeah. said, depending on where they've run to and what they're running on and mm-hmm. how antagonistic they may be. Sometimes that's really hard. Mm-hmm. So I'm not acting like that's easy. I mean, we have a family in our church. I don't know if this is still the situation, but they have a prodigal who married a girl and I don't want to give too many details away, but basically this woman, and I'm not trying to pick on women, but this woman Are you sure? has, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this woman um, basically has completely isolated this guy from his family mm. and they don't have any contact anymore with her son. And so uh, I'm not even saying she's she's the thing that took him away from Christ. He was already going away from Christ. Yeah. But then he marries this non-Christian girl and she's at least one of these men can do this too, but she's she, they're in such a situation where they're like if he texts us on our birthday, we feel like it's a win. Mm. And so it just depends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. whereas it's different it's like the prodigal, he lives down the street from me. We go hunting every you know Saturday, and hunting. I'm all you know. I'm making stuff. I'm hunting, <laughs> and I'm and I'm trying, and I'm looking for the opportunity to talk to him. That's yeah. that's different than I see my son at Christmas, mm-hmm. yeah. And I, we have three hours, and his wife's there, and I don't you know, and she also doesn't believe, and I don't know how much to. I will say this. I will say that I have found that every new season and stage of life uh, opens up new opportunities. That's you know, good. say say your say yeah. your uh, make something up. Say your sister is a prodigal. And you're like, man, it's so hard. My sister's a prodigal, and I only see her three times a year. Well, wait till she becomes an aunt. Wait till you are you have some kids, and then all of a sudden she's Aunt mm-hmm. Susie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it's like, okay, all of a sudden she's going to be, God's going to, God has used, I've seen this in our families, God uses a new age and stage of life to re-pull yeah. a relationship back in. Yeah. And maybe it's, hey, you know, making this aunt up, you know, hey, Aunt Jessica, we're going to, we at night we read the Jesus Storybook Bible, you know, and Aunt Jessica, who might normally be antagonistic when her favorite nephew's in the room, says, well, let's read it, you yeah. know? And so yeah. sometimes you, sometimes God uses that to open up new doors. That's good. What I hear you saying it is person by person, experience yeah. by experience. Yes. And that's one of the reasons, and we're going to talk about this next week, well, you are rather in the podcast, that we need community. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because in the context of community, we have a multitude of advisors who who can lead us and guide us and help us individually like get to the place and back on the path following the Lord step by step and um, I'm excited to talk about that a little bit next week but I'm curious Andre what advice would you give to someone who is maybe currently in a season of running from the Lord Oh man um, that's a that's a tough question um I would say, well, different areas. For the parents, don't stop praying for your kid or spouse or whoever it be. Prayer really does work. Um, and then for the person who's stuck as a prodigal, it depends, again, because it's willful. And so um, I think a lot of a prodigal coming back is the Lord has to do a lot of the work. We do our part in praying. And but also giving a, as you said, Kyle or Carrie, um, showing that Christianity is like not not an alternative, but like the alternative lifestyle, like in a good way. Like, hey, Christianity is, isn't just a bunch of do's and don'ts. Like, we do this because it leads to life. We don't do this because it leads to death. You know. And so I would say, um, really coming alongside the prodigal, you never want to congratulate them in their sin because that just enforces their habits, but also showing like, hey, if they bring up something like, oh, I I totally understand that. And hopefully you can have some real world experiences to pour into them, but also be like, hey, I used to do that. Let me show you how Christ changed my life. And like not in a preaching at them way. Um, So I'd say that. And then again, for the prodigal, like as I know I've harped on it so many times, but it really is the defining moment of, I think, why prodigals come home is because they have an encounter with Christ. That's and good. so um, I can't stress that enough. I think just praying for the prodigals in your life to have an encounter with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a sister who, I know you, you said this, but she is a prodigal, and I love her dearly. And 
I remember at our prayer night, that's what I prayed. I was like, Lord, this year, I want my sister to have an encounter with you. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because it doesn't matter how much we do all the Christian things. Mm-hmm. Unless she encounters you, mm-hmm. she's not going to come yeah. back. That's and good. so we can, you know, again, show that, hey, there's an abundant life in being a believer. Yeah. Like definitely not saying that that's not important, but I definitely would say like pray for your prodigal to have an encounter with Christ. That's good. Yeah, I think that's really good. Kyle, is there anything that you would share specifically to that prodigal, maybe someone who is struggling with their faith, they're walking away from the Lord, like what message of like hope and encouragement would you extend to them? Well, it depends on what get. It depends on where they are and what they're dealing with. I mean, yeah. if you're, you know, hmm, a uh, couple things. Um, it's normal to have doubts because mm-hmm. it depends on why you're prodigal. So it's, it's part of it is normalizing some of these things. Yeah. Okay, it's normal to have doubts. It's normal to face temptation. Yeah, it, it's it's normal to at times feel that what you've experienced as a Christian is restrictive, mm-hmm. depending on the environment. The, these yeah. are normal. People are, people like to think I'm so unique and I'm and now I need to go run away. It's like and, and you don't have to run away. You know, like I mean, that kind of part of that what I talk about in my sermon is like I think what I would would tell somebody early on is. As I showed, I think I hope in my sermon this week, is it's very costly to run from God, yeah. and that and Amen. that you know I think people who are prodigals who do come back, mm-hmm. I mean they see the grace of God in it and they're glad how God used mm-hmm. it and the lessons they learned, but they all wish they could have those years back yep. to walk with God. If someone's yeah. like, because you know you. Temptation, he kind of said it, but you know, if there's one time if you grew up in a home to be a prodigal, it's kind of going to be your college early twenties time. And, and, and sometimes you tell yourself, well, I'll come back, you know, I'll come back, I'll do, but it's like, uh, sin hardens the heart. So yeah. like you that's said, God's got to work. So sometimes people think, oh, that's well, like, well, man, seven years of, and then you, you build all these bad habits and sinful patterns into your life Yeah, that God will be gracious and restore you from, but it will just take time. So mm-hmm. I just feel like, man, the, the word is if you're starting to run away, you know, maybe tell somebody, hey, I'm, I'm open up about mm. it. I'm struggling with these things. Yeah. I've got questions. And uh, and know that at least here at two cities, I know all good Christian churches feel this way. We want to we want to help you repent, which means turn around and come back. That's so good. I think just what you're saying there about want, knowing that your Christian community is there for you, and they want to help you mm. walk towards Christ and walk away from sin. Yes. And yeah. they can't do that unless you share that with yep. them. And I think we are afraid a lot of times early on to confess our sins yes. to other believers. I know we've talked about that before on this podcast, um, but there is such freedom and such light in putting our sin and our struggle and our doubt out in the open yep. and allowing our community to come 100%. alongside of us. So as we close today, Andre, thank you so much for coming and sharing your story. Um, I know I was really encouraged by it. I know others that are listening, parents of prodigals, prodigals themselves, people are just struggling to figure out, do I really want to follow this Christ? Are going to be encouraged by your story and excited for continued conversations in the book of Jonah. So hope you'll come back next week. Listen to the sermon if you haven't gotten a chance on Jonah chapter one. And we look forward to seeing you next week on Open Bible, Open Life.